Loneliness is the thing that makes you go on YouTube and watch video essays. Hi. A lot of us deal with it, and seemingly now more than ever. Throughout the year, we've talked about loneliness a lot. We've talked about a so-called loneliness epidemic in the United States. We've talked about hikikomori existing in the East and West alike. One of the strongest aspects of loneliness is a lack of physical connection with other human beings. On social media, we're seeing more and more people talk about this struggle with physical connection, and it's being called touch starvation. Normally, when I'm trying to sleep, I do all these silly things, like I roll over and imagine that I'm sleeping next to someone. I kept thinking to myself, like, why the hell am I doing that? I'm like, oh, I haven't been hugged in such a long time. At the end of the day, like, we all need human touch to survive. I swear to God, there's something wrong with me. Sometimes it gets called skin hunger, and that's like kind of a kind of a cool name, but I feel like it also creeps me out. So let's go with touch starvation, the more popular name. In this video, let's talk about how physical touch and a lack thereof affect the human brain. We'll talk about how society reproduces this lack of physical touch through social ideas, and we'll close with an aside about prison. But first. Today's video is sponsored by Blinkist. The Blinkist app enables you to understand the most important things from over 6,600 nonfiction books and podcasts in just 15 minutes. Not all at once but like each one. I find this app helpful for when you want to dig into the major points of books that you haven't already had the chance to check out, sometimes in preparation for when you'll eventually read the book or sometimes just to know about it when other people talk about it. This has helped me in particular for reading some Thich Nhat Hanh books that I'm interested in so I can discuss them with other Buddhists. Right now I'm starting How to Love and I'm highlighting parts about how love can be defined differently from conventional wisdom and focus more on sharing in other people's suffering. The app offers blinks, which are these key points highlighted in written and audio form. Blinkist is offering a new feature called Blinkist Spaces, which allows you to create a space with friends or family, wherein you can recommend titles to each other. All members of a shared space can access all of the shared titles in that space, whether or not they have a Blinkist premium subscription. That's going to be a neat thing to share with my mom because she's working all the time, but she's always interested in philosophy and always looking for some summaries of some philosophy books and concepts. You can get a 7-day free trial and a 25% off Blinkist annual premium subscription by using the promo link in the description. So give it a try. Thanks to Blinkist for sponsoring this video and let's get to it. In this video, I'm going to start with a scholarly article titled Physical Contact and Loneliness, Being Touched Reduces Perceptions of Loneliness. It was published in the National Library of Medicine by three researchers, two from Mexico City and one from Oxford. Its purpose is that it, quote, addresses the connection between loneliness and physical contact, unquote. Early on in the article, it cites other recent approaches to a concept called social touch. One such article defines social touch as non-sexual, pleasant, effective touch that is social in nature. Biological factors that make us pleased by social touch include tactile fibers in the skin, which respond preferentially to gentle, slow, caress-like stroking, and at temperatures near those of human skin. This article is notable because it also delves into how certain types of human touch can be considered pleasant or unpleasant, which is something that is, of course, a complicated idea because the brain is complicated and perceives different things as pleasant for different reasons. In the Physical Contact and Loneliness article, social touch is noted as a powerful bonding mechanism that humans share with other primates that could constitute one environmental trigger for loneliness under an evolutionary perspective and one mechanism we use to reconnect with our social network. And it also, in defining loneliness, cites the evolutionary theory of loneliness, which posits that feeling lonely is an alarm against survival risks associated with social isolation. Of course, there's other theories of loneliness, but that one kind of makes sense to me, so... So yeah, <laughs> let's go with it. It cites numerous studies in the overall finding that touch and physical displays of warmth or caring are important for human social bonding and psychological well-being. And then it points out that certain cultures are more inclined away from this type of interaction. For example, 
Some cold or low contact cultures associate independence and self reliance with not needing physical contact, or rather, they associate high contact needs with dependency or weakness. This is the case in Anglo Saxon societies, which are considered low contact and individualistic. In those individualistic settings, the ideal of independence and self reliance might result in less social touch and potentially more loneliness. They synthesize this with pointing out the increasing amounts of literature describing how loneliness is kind of a trend in Western societies. Western lifestyle and contemporary urban life are associated with growing levels of loneliness and extended periods of people living alone, which increase vulnerability to loneliness. According to the Mental Health Foundation's report, most of the risks of experiencing loneliness associated to contemporary Western lifestyle relate to the impossibility of, or limitations to, obtaining close and intimate physical contact and bonding experiences. Loneliness is an increasing concern in individualistic and low contact societies, even though people are used to reduced physical contact and most of them strive to become independent and self reliant. So let's talk about self reliance. I think it's important to talk about self reliance here because it is a concept that is so key to our understanding of our society and our individualism and all that. Famously, especially on this website, advice about masculinity tends to urge people to be a loner in some way or another. This is embodied in the Sigma male concept that gained steam a few years ago. Glamour magazine ran a piece about what it takes to be a Sigma male. They cited a psychologist who said, men who identify as Sigma often enjoy their own company, don't conform to societal norms, and are described as a lone wolf. They are regularly stereotyped as honorable, charismatic, and magnetic, and are seen to be unafraid to take risks or make their own decisions. This same psychologist also noted that it can be, you know, hard to be in a relationship with a Sigma male because, you know, they only focus on themselves. $25. The idea seems to still be appealing to some people, although it's obviously become a lot more joked about with the rise of the Sigma grind set meme and how that went along with just a general social awareness of how these concepts of masculinity and this type of advice is corny and not great for building genuine social connections with other people. Would you like to hear the specials? Not if you want to keep your spleen. And ultimately, this stuff is revolving around an idea of self-sufficiency, which is being exposed for what it is. That is naive and contrived and harmful. 99% of our lives depend on other people. <laughs> they depend on other people to build the homes that we, if we're fortunate, live in and farm and cook the food that we, if we're fortunate, get to eat. And hell, to even bring us into this world in the first place. But the concept of self-reliance still pervades modern ideas of individuation. That's especially in the West, but it can be seen in, you know, the East too. Our whole idea of what it means to mature and become an adult is based on the concept that we're going to slowly wean away at our reliance on our family until eventually we're able to become independent and provide for ourselves. But do we ever really become independent? Do we ever really not need other people's presence, let alone their resources and help? What is a credit card and a loan, if not a place through which you can become indebted to other people in order to provide for the most essential things in your life? Shout out to David Graeber. Self-help advice is constantly predicated on the idea that you alone can turn around your lot in life and that all you need is the confidence and motivation to do so. This is something we covered in a video in January and also Ola Sunvia covered in July. Shout out to Olivia. Someone like Gary Vee or the wizard Liz even can give you speeches about how you're the only one who can fix your problems with the proper amount of motivation and focus. Although really, why do people watch these types of people if not for the fact that it feels like someone else is talking to them? Ultimately, they're addressing their own loneliness, right? It's nice to have someone able to give you advice about how you should love yourself more and be more confident and how you should use your own power to change the bad things in your life. And here's the thing, I like confidence. I do like confidence. But what is confidence in one's self? 
What is self-confidence, if not confidence in other people? I'll explain. To be confident in your own beauty, for example, is to be confident also in the beauty of the other people who look like you, but also especially the people who looked like you before you looked like you, who influenced the way that you look, and also a confidence in other people who see that beauty in you, that they are correct in what is beautiful and what is not beautiful. Similarly, self-reliance exists only insofar as reliance on your society exists. You can rely on yourself to put food on your table because you can rely on the local supermarkets to have food that is provided for you to buy. And yet, we are taught to not think about contributing to those environments we rely on inherently to rely on ourselves, but rather to focus on relying on ourselves as if it's in a vortex rather than try to make the people around us happier and healthier and richer. We focus on making ourselves happier and healthier and richer, as if we can just do that on our own. Isn't this functionally irrational? Yeah, if you believe that societies should be, you know, happier and healthier and betterly inter- betterly and more interconnected in a better way. But if you prefer the opposite, that people be isolated and miserable and unhealthy, then this is perfectly rational. Solitary confinement, or the housing of an adult or juvenile with minimal to rare meaningful contact with other individuals, is commonly cited as the most brutal way to incarcerate someone. One study finds that, for example, there are numerous physical health issues that consistently emerge from it, including 1. Skin irritations and weight fluctuation associated with the restrictive conditions of solitary confinement. 2. Untreated and mistreated chronic conditions associated with the restrictive policies of solitary confinement. and 3. Musculoskeletal pain exacerbated by both restrictive conditions and policies. And then, of course, we all know that the biggest, most notable effects of solitary confinement are on the brain. There are numerous studies that describe this to varying degrees, but this study in particular goes and talks to over 100 Washington state inmates who have experienced solitary confinement. And it found that anxiety and depression were the one in two most commonly experienced conditions among them. The Prison Policy Initiative finds that even though people in solitary confinement comprise only 6% to 8% of the total prison population, they account for approximately half of those who die by suicide. Moreover, solitary is a hotbed for the development of mental health conditions which can, in the experience of one prisoner who spent years in its grasp, can cause you to struggle with even the basic functions of living, like sense of direction. I bring up solitary confinement not just to project this sense of morality, to have some sort of empty empathy for prisoners, but to help people understand that these issues of isolation are inherently connected to what prisoners go through. Prisoners undergo the worst of human conditions on our watch with our approval as a society. We need to learn deeply from them as we fight for them. One such connection that we can talk about with prisoners, not just nebulously, but in terms of them experiencing it on a larger scale in the same process that we're experiencing it, is that of isolation. Who could be more touch-starved than prisoners? Who is told more about self-reliance than prisoners? Who is told more that their lot in life is the result of their decisions and them alone than prisoners? A podcast from the publication Street Roots quotes a former prisoner named Joshua Wright on how prison's isolation from caring touch, with touch in general being associated with violence, continuously worsens a person's ability to deal with touch and human contact at all. I just recall how hard it was uh, to feel kind of connected to other people. Uh, we got penalized for even hugging each other, um, handshakes sometimes were allowed and even then they're like you can't really be touching each other still to this day i do have issues at with and being in large large crowds they cultivate that when we get out into the real world we have to be around people like i walked in walmart when i first got out i was like oh hell no i can't do this 
<laughs> I can't do this. This is too many people. It's, they cultivate the social distancing so well. And you want to do, you want to walk the straight lines because you, you don't want to get an incident report. So you're toiling these little lines, trying to do the right thing. And you get out and you're like, still trying to toil a line that's not even there anymore. So it's, it's super stressful. In terms of like being a man and being in a male prison, that's not tolerated by the guards. Cause like you said, we're not supposed to do it. We're not supposed to, you know, have any type of romantic relationship with other prisoners, but right. also, you know, in terms of like gang conduct and like, you know, codes and stuff like that in prison politics, yeah. we're not supposed to do that with each other either. We're policed by like both sides. And, and like you said, but there's, there's like that void, there's a vacuum of need and, and yeah. those needs still come up. And like you said, it, it doesn't even have to be sexual, like cuddling. For me, it twisted my mind a lot. It's just like, yeah. I don't know how to touch people. When I got right. out, to kind of relearn that. You know, I didn't know what safe touch was. I didn't know if like how it's supposed to feel anymore. This is consistent with the opinions of a researcher brought later on in the podcast named Tiffany Field, who is the founder and director of the Human Touch Institute at the University of Miami School of Medicine. Anyone who is in touch for a prolonged period of time is going to be depressed, number one, because, as I said, their serotonin levels won't be that high. And they will have a lot of stress because their cortisol levels will be elevated. And probably they'll experience some illness because the immune system is not being activated by that kind of stimulation. And we know from our studies that they will also become aggressive. Uh, we know that because we studied preschool age kids and adolescents in Paris and Miami, and we looked at how much touch stimulation they were getting, mostly in the form of physical contact from their parents or their friends, and we found that the kids in Miami had significantly less touching and they were significantly more physically and verbally aggressive. So those are some of the effects that we would expect from touch deprivation. There's a lot of prisons where people are not allowed to touch because there's mandates against it, but there's also aversion to touch. And in fact, they have a, they've coined a term called prisonization, which is an aversion to touch. In our video about hikikomori, we talked about how loneliness is socially reproduced. Those who do not meet social expectations of school achievement, labor, indebtedness, and overall ability are all but condemned to being alone by themselves. And the more we are forced into this loneliness, the more we claim it, the more we produce it in our own lives. The people who struggle the most with communication and affection are the ones who have been deprived of them for so long. The only company that a lonely person keeps is their loneliness. I hope you enjoyed this video. It's a bit shorter than what I usually do, but it's December, so we're gonna do a little bit shorter because we're trying to spend some more time with our family and have fun. I wanna shout out our channel memberships. Channel members are very helpful to keeping this channel running. In fact, they're integral. We need them. Come, please be a member. I wanna shout out our newest members, including Sofia Villarreal, Fiona Christie, Kim Dauber, Serafina, At Home, Shill, and Joe Bethke. Thank you guys, thank you all, and thank you for watching, for supporting in however way you can. And remember, get out there. Go touch people in a, in a, good, in a good way. Like in, a, in an affectionate way, like with their consent and stuff like that. Like, you know, hug your friends. Um, if you don't have friends, uh, let's help you make some friends. Come, 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 uh, come ask for some ad advice in the comment section about how to make friends and stuff like that. Bye. <laughs>